one of the Mafia's most trusted associates, who pledged his loyalty to New York's most notorious family. Cool cases was all killers. But an undercover sting. Now we got the rules of for conspiracy to distribute narcotics. And a bloody shootout with a rival gangster forced this mobster to turn on his own family. So the time I was facing, I saw that people started turning on me. Mikey Flat Top DeRosa, cooperating witness. We took out the core of the Lucchese, Bonanno, Colombo, and Gambino family. A necessary evil in the war against the mafia. Mike DeRosa should be afraid for his life right now. If I could turn back time, honestly, I wouldn't have been involved in the drugs because that was the downfall. That's what buried us. An attempted drug deal by one of Mike DeRose's associates goes terribly wrong. Armed federal agents disguised as gangsters ripped DeRose's dealer of all his narcotics. The dealer has no idea he has been set up or that his phone is tapped. He panics and calls many of his Lucchese higher-ups, including DeRosa. Our cars were always bugged. They had monitors in their listening, listening devices. DeRosa's associate cannot begin to realize the chain reaction he has started. It's the beginning of the end for Mike DeRosa. My name is Michael DeRosa. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I had my education with business in the street from when I was eight years old. Growing up in Bensonhurst, you'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to be around organized crime. Every kid in the neighborhood knew who the local wise guy was. They either stood away from them or they wanted to be like them. I'm a young kid. I, was, I remember I was eight years old sweeping in a car service. That's what really started to get me around those people. They would just give me good money. To me, it was good money. A few couple of dollars here and a couple of dollars there. Later, come to find out that as I got older, that car service was a mob joint. The front was cabs and whatnot, but then they had the wall up with the door, and all the old men would be back there, cigars, playing cards. That car service was a mob front owned by two powerful Colombo crime family soldiers. At eight years old, Michael DeRosa couldn't have imagined how years later he would play a key role in dismantling the hierarchy of four of the five crime families in New York. From that, I wind up getting involved with drugs. My older brother, he used to deal a lot of weed. He had several uh, pot spots. My brother's 15 years older than me. Being that my brother was so much older, he was like sort of a father figure in the house because my parents were never there. Uh, my mother, father, they worked their whole lives. My father worked three jobs. My mother worked as a seamstress. They did a lot of sacrifices for us. The Rosa basically came from a uh, middle-class family, good, hard-working people. You know, he didn't really have a tough life as far as I see it, but he chose the life. Me and my other brother were an embarrassment to my family. I think it's sad, but what he did was, I was a young kid, my parents used to ask him to take me to school. I wind up not going to school. And I'm hanging out with him on a corner while he's dealing. As a young kid, 13, I started dealing weed. And I was never the type to be working for somebody. So what I did was, I knew my brother was dealing. I used to steal a little weed from him and package it up. So as it went on, I started doing my own thing. I was making more money than the adults in my neighborhood. I'm making between three to 500 clean a week as a kid. DeRosa got an early taste of the good life, and he wasn't about to give it up. His own family couldn't provide it, but he found a family that could. At the time, there were five mafia families that ruled New York City. The Colombos, the Bonanos, Gambinos, Genovese, and the Lucchese's. What gravitated me towards the Lucchese's, I knew the way every family was, and the Lucchese's was, was more of a serious family, weren't flamboyant. The Lucchese family's roots go back to 1931. They were one of the original families organized by Lucky Luciano. And it's really big heyday came in the 40s and the 50s, mainly from a gangster by the name of Tommy Three Finger Brown Lucchese. And he was really the genius who uh, 
brought the Lucchese family in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s into the big time. He was big into the garment center rackets, big into loan sharking, big into gambling. Lucchese died a natural death, and when he died, uh, he was taken over by one of his acolytes, one of his close confederates, a man by the name of Tony Dux Corallo. Unfortunately for Dux Corallo, he was convicted in the famous commission case in 1986 and sentenced to life imprisonment and died in prison. Now, when he left, the people who took over, took over the Lucchese family were two rather, shall we say, ambitious but wild characters. Vic Amuso, Vittorio Vic Amuso, and Anthony Gaspipe Casso. For the first time, this was a total change in the makeup of the bosses of the family. Amuso and Casso trusted nobody. And what they did, they led to a major blood purge in the family. If they didn't like the looks of somebody, they wanted to bump off. There were 10 or 11 capos who were killed. For a kid like DeRosa to be aligned with a ruthless, powerful, and extraordinarily wealthy family like the Lucchese's was to be part of the royal family. The Lucchese's was all killers and one of the richest families. And they were just feared. There was just something about them that just, I was like, this is what I want. This is what I want to align myself to. Each family was structured in a similar way. And the way it operates is the workhorses are the crews. Each family has a certain number of crews that can vary from 10 to 20. And what these crews are, they're the people out on the streets. They're the people doing all sorts of things to bring in lucre, to bring in moolah. One of the ways they do it is through drugs. Drugs has always been a fascinating and easy score. Well, Mikey Flatop de Rosa was an earner on the streets of Brooklyn. And all of these guys ran together, if you will, even though they were from different families. Sometimes the money would interchange and get kicked up in a different way. Everybody had their own territory, their own group. And the soldiers and the associates have to figure out schemes, figure out illicit things to do, bookmaking, do extortion, anything they could think of to keep bringing the money to their capos who then have to bring the money up to the underbosses, who bring the money to their boss. Oh, and, and Mikey DeRosa handled the crew for the Lucchese crime family, and he kicked up to a guy named Froggy Galeone. DeRosa's first introduction to the Lucchese crime family came from James Froggy Galeone. At the time, Mike DeRosa was an associate of the Lucchese crime family, and any money that he earned got kicked up to the soldier, which was Jimmy Galeone in this case. Getting into that life, who groomed me was Jimmy. He was a good guy. You know, he was more like an older brother. I looked up to him. Jimmy Galeone proposed to Rosa to become a made member of the Lucchese crime family. And what will happen is you will have to be sponsored by a made member of that family. And I, I see Jimmy the way he is and the respect that he carried. I knew where I wanted to go now in life, so I hung around Jimmy. The difference between uh, Jimmy Galeone and Mike DeRosa is Jimmy Galeone really never had a chance. Jimmy's father was Ralphie Wiggs Galeone, who was a main guy in the Gambino crime family. Jimmy grew up in the shadows of organized crime, and his father got killed when Jimmy was nine years old. So Jimmy was basically raised on the streets of Bath Avenue by members of organized crime, and he knew no other way. You know, there's expectations when you join a crew, especially a crew as strong as the one that was run by Froggy Galeone. And you weren't going to become a manager, and that's what Mikey DeRosa was, a manager, unless you're making some money. So I'm sure that whatever he was doing criminally, it was whatever his bosses told him to do. Drug dealing, loan sharking, and extortion were a part of his daily routine. As a solid earner and with Galeone by his side, DeRosa was making a name for himself within the family. But he was quickly making enemies outside the family. I got into a beef with Joey Scarpa which is Greg Scarpa's son. Joey Shiro was the stepson of Gregory Scarpa, and Joey Shiro was a drug dealer, and he basically operated under uh, Greg Scarpa's umbrella. When you're Scarpa's son, nobody messes with you. Greg Scarpa was a capo for the Colombo crime family. And Greg Scarpa was considered very, very dangerous, and there was a war, and guys like Mikey DeRosa started to arm themselves with assault rifles and roam the streets of Brooklyn shooting at one another. There was a bloody war in the Colombo crime family between the arena and the Persico factions, leaving a trail of bodies throughout Brooklyn. They were fighting against each other, so everybody was killing everybody. A deadly gunfight elevates DeRosa's stature within the family. So I was like, here we go. So I put a gun in everybody's hand. I said, let's go outside.
Since the early 1990s, many members of the Mafia have become cooperating witnesses who turned on their crime families. After being involved with drugs, extortion, and murder, Mike DeRosa became one of them. But first, an incident with Colombo crime family soldier Greg Scarpa earned Mike respect within his family. I got into a beef with Joey Scarpa, which is Greg Scarpa's son. Greg Scarpa was a captain with the Colombo crime family. Along with the Lucchese's, they were one of New York's richest and most feared mob organizations. Scarpa was known as a ruthless killer. Not only was Gregory Scarpa known as a, as a killer on the street, and, you know, they used to call him the Grim Reaper, but Gregory was a bona fide tough guy. He was good with his hands, and he had a reputation that he'll throw a good beating on you if you crossed him. Gregory wasn't a guy that, that you wanted to screw around with, because Gregory would, would kill you in a heartbeat. He had a strong crew. They were the most feared guys in, in that whole area. Greg kept everything under control. In fact, nobody even bothered from other families on 13th Avenue because they knew Greg watched over them. He really didn't want Joey to be in the mob, but Joey liked the life. So Joey became like a junior drug dealer. He started to de deal marijuana and cocaine in the neighborhood. From what I understand, Mike DeRosa had a beef with one of Joey Shearer's workers. Me and Joey used to hang out together as kids. Joey was like 16, 17. DeRosa lived like a block away from me, and they're just neighborhood kids just hanging out with them. He wasn't very close with DeRosa, but, you know, there was drug dealing, and they were part of it. As we got older, we hated each other. No, Joey, they didn't like each other very much. Mike DeRosa was also a young drug dealer that Joey messed with because Joey was in his territory. All the guys had their territory, whether it was pronounced or, you know, subtle. And I think that Joey and his friends, they didn't care. They thought they could get away with things because of his father. He was one of those guys that was never a tough guy. He was a tough guy to his family. Everybody always feared Joey because of his father. Oh, Joey was very, he knew he was very well protected because of his father. So that kid really never had to do anything to be a tough guy because of his father. So people would never raise their hands to him, never nothing. This guy borrowed money off me, and he wasn't paying my juice, but he was working for Joey. So I caught him one day in front of his house, and I go in his pocket, I pull his money out. He goes, that's not my money, that's Joey's money. I said, well, then you go pay Joey back. I said, this is my, it was in your pocket, I took it from you. I said, it's my money now. So I leave, and a few hours later, I drop my girlfriend off. I go home, a kid that was friends with me, Joey Rendazzo, comes to my house. They got baseball bats. So they try to hit me with the bat, I run, I go grab a gun off my dresser. I run, fly outside my house, they get in a little Ford Escort, and they're taking off. I'm chasing them up the block with my pistol. They're gone, they, they came to a, a gunfight with a bat, and they left. I know something's gonna come out of this. Well, Greg was sitting on the couch, he was having a drink, and he wasn't acting as himself because he had gotten dementia from the AIDS virus. The Colombo captain contracted HIV from a tainted blood transfusion in 1987. You know, he's like not thinking straight. So now Joe and Dazzo said, would you believe DeRosa pulled a gun on Joey? And he says, he pulled a gun on my son? Greg took the gun and he says, come on, get in the car. So I called Jimmy up. Jimmy Gallione, Mike DeRosa's street boss within the Lucchese crime family. Jimmy goes, just stay in your house, don't go out. I can't have this right now because he was getting made. I'm in my house, my brother's there too. I see Greg pull up. I was like, F DeRosa and his crew aren't fearful at all. Like who in their right mind would pull a gun on Greg Scarpa's son? Nobody, unless knowing the consequences, he would kill them. And he would. The brain surgeon that my brother is, comes flying out of the house and goes and talks to Greg. So I was like, here we go. So I put a gun in everybody's hand. I said, let's go outside. I go up to the car, I shake his hand. He goes, what's going on with you and my son? I said, this has nothing to do with it. Your son has to do with the guy that owes me money. I pulled that out of his pocket. I didn't pull it out of your son's pocket. So now he tells his son, get out of the car and straighten your beef out with Mike. So he gets out of the car. He says, yeah, Joe, we've been friends for years. So he shakes my hand like everything's over. So he tells me, Mike, tell your guys to go inside. I should have caught on, but I didn't. My guys are walking away, and as they're walking away, I felt like I got hit with a baseball bat. The 
so many people shooting. The noise was extremely loud. He shot me in my shoulder. It went into my, it went to my neck. All I saw was Marvin. He went out shooting the whole car. No, he emptied the whole clip on the car. Ronald Moran, a.k.a. Messy Marvin, one of DeRosa's crew members in the Lucchese crime family. Because of him, I'm alive today. Joey Rondazzo's in the back seat. And he winds up getting hit in the back of the head. Rondazzo died two days later in the hospital. I get up and I try to run towards my house now. And as I'm running, he hits me again in the back. So it's skin my ass. And then he hits me again, hits my side. So I got hit three times, and Greg got shot in the eye. Greg's bullet went through his nose and came out, took his eye out. Now I'm thinking he's dead. He slumped over in the car. Joey ran through backyards. I don't know where he went. Joey Scarpa was lucky. He escaped unharmed and made it home safely. So now we're in the house, and I'm on the phone all happy because I'm thinking Greg's dead. I'm telling Jimmy, we got him. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, Greg, we got him. I woke up, the car's gone. I was like, what the f the Guy drove away with a hole in his eye. Greg got in the driver's seat and drove home. I couldn't believe what I saw. I mean, he was holding his eye, but he didn't know he was shot. One of the males got out of the car and a shooting erupted. What the specific connection is between all these three individuals, but we're very anxious to talk to his stepson, Mr. Joey Shiro Scarpa, because uh, we know there's an association between Joey Shiro and uh, Mr. Randazzo and Mr. DeRosa. What that association is, we don't know. As a result of this shootout, they really, they gained a lot of steam on the street, and guys sort of respected them for the way they stood up to Gregory Scarpo, who was known on the street as a complete lunatic at the time. Greg never failed on a hit. Greg, every person that he went to kill died. There's nobody that ever was able to say, I survived an incident with Greg Scarpa. You just didn't hear it. I was the only one that did. And I was the only one that ever got to Greg. The other side had tried to kill Greg. They dressed up as Jewish guys with beanies and curls on a bicycle, riding by, shooting at him, shooting in the car. Never could anybody get to him. So when that happened, that escalated me after that shootout to making a lot more money. As a result of this gun battle that the Rosa and Moran had with Scarpa, they were basically given immunity. They were on record with the Lucchese crime family, and it, it, was, it was known that nothing was going to happen to these two kids. Mike's involvement with drugs and extortion lead to murder. I know that we killed this guy over slapping a captain's wife in the face. After surviving a gun battle with notorious Columbo hitman Gregory Scarpa, Mike DeRosa and his crew were deemed untouchable by all five New York City crime families. Mikey Flattop DeRosa. He was a guy who was a real earner. The mob liked him because he was making a lot of money. He was a manager of a couple of the drug crews for the Lucchese crime family. Where did drugs come in? They came in from downtown, Brooklyn. Came in off the ships. We were getting the keys from them and then distributing them all over the place. We had Brooklyn tied down. We had Brooklyn, we had downtown, we had Manhattan, the clubs in Manhattan, parts of Florida. And one way or another, every drug dealer had something to do with us, whether they were paying or they were buying. I was dealing all the drugs and everything, and I was like, all right, where am I gonna put my money? I saw guys that were doing loans and everything. So I took my money and I started pushing it down the street telling people, you know, I got money, I'll lend it to you. So the illegal money that I was making with the drugs, I was there, in turn, becoming a bank now too. So now I was making money on top of money. Uh, for instance, if I had 100,000 on the street, within a year, that 100,000 became 300,000. We used to deal with phony money also. In addition to his loan sharking business, DeRosa also distributed counterfeit money. I remember one time going to Florida over a weekend. We went there with, I believe, 70, 80,000. We blew 80,000 over a weekend. What's funny is nobody ever questioned us. When we were in Florida, it was hysterical. Our money was glowing on top of the bar. You got the black light. Nobody ever questioned us. I guess they were scared. They weren't the bartenders or whatnot. They were afraid to say anything. So we're walking around Florida and blasting money everywhere. 
drug dealing and loan sharking were not the only things that DeRosa was asked to do as a key member of the Lucchese family. I get a phone call. They told me, you got to come. I was like, come? They were like, yeah, we got to go do like a piece of work. Meaning you have to go kill somebody, sit on someone. So I was like, I'm on the way to my friend's funeral. You know, and they're like, no, we were sitting on a guy in Staten Island. We sat on him for another week, and then we killed him. They didn't let me know why we were killing him, but after it was done, I know that we killed this guy over slapping a captain's wife in the face. And that's the reason why he died. As DeRosa's star was rising within the mafia, so was his reputation with the NYPD's organized crime unit. Although they did not have proof of DeRosa's involvement with drug trafficking and loan sharking or murder, it was the disappearance of a family friend that really put the heat on Mike for the first time in his career. The way the case started against Mike DeRosa was there was an individual who was reporting missing by uh, the name of Carmine Gargano. A real good kid at the time, and he was a friend of mine. Carmine would do anything for like my family, like he was good with construction and come from a great family. Great people. Kamani was a, he was a good in the school. He never had any problem with him. His grades were good. But he had that envision in his head about gangsters. He always wanted to hang out and he wanted to get involved. I wouldn't let him get involved. So we got into a fallout. Two weeks before my brother Carmine went missing, there was a notification at a bar in, in Bay Ridge. DeRosa and my brother Carmine were at. Gargano was seen having an argument with DeRosa in a bar called T-Birds on 86th Street in Brooklyn. I get into an argument when he's in the bar and he tries to say hello to me. I look at him, he's hanging out with my enemies now that we've been trying to kill each other. So he goes and tries to shake my hand. I says, get your hand away from me. And I says, let's go outside. I punch him in his face. He went up against the car. Then my friend jumps over a car, slides across it, punches him, and then he tries to run away and I throw a bottle at him. And he ran away. That was that. He winds up disappearing a few days later. Because of that fight, many people in the neighborhood assumed DeRosa had something to do with Carmine's disappearance. They were telling everybody in the neighborhood that it was me, but it wasn't. Uh, the last time that I saw my son it was July 10, 1994. One Out of the mother's frustration because she was unable to convince the police department to take a missing persons report on her son, she appeared at a town hall meeting where Rudy Giuliani was present. Uh, you know, like uh, Giuliani was on a podium and uh, I raised my hands and I told him what, I, what, what my problem was. Rudy Giuliani had tasked the uh, detectives from the 6A precinct to put Carmine Gagano's name on a missing persons report and to make this case a high priority case. At the time, Rudolph Giuliani was the mayor of New York, building his reputation prosecuting some of the Mafia's most notorious members. Giuliani felt compassion for them and started the investigation on us. That was part of our downfall. With a young man missing and drugs flooding the streets, the NYPD and the DEA began to put the heat on Mike DeRosa and his crew. We were under investigation already. They knew what we were doing. Basically, they had a list of names, and on that list was Mike DeRosa and his associates in the drug trade. As a drug dealer earning millions of dollars a year for the Lucchese crime family, Mike DeRosa was on his way to becoming a made member of the organization. But the altercation with Carmine Gargano put the NYPD hot on his tail. It was a coordinated effort between the police and the DEA that kicked the investigation into overdrive. The New York City Police Department and DEA were investigating these organizations. We were under investigation already. They knew what we were doing. They surveillanced us. We were all joining forces to try to take these organizations down, pretending that you're somebody that you're not. In the case of these Lucchese drug dealers in Brooklyn, the DEA staged a fake robbery, ripping one of DeRosa's street-level drug dealers of all his narcotics. After the undercover robbery, DeRosa's dealer panicked and made several calls to his higher-ups in the Lucchese family. 
I got a call from the DEA, and the DEA says, listen, you got to cover this. We got something coming over the phone. These guys keep making the same mistake over and over and over. They talk on the phone like it's unguarded. They talk about criminal activity, and the next thing you know, you're up on the next phone. This undercover surveillance allowed the DEA and NYPD to identify many of the dealers who were selling drugs under the umbrella of the Lucchese crime family. Basically, they had a list of names, and on that list was Mike DeRosa and his associates in the drug trade. DeRosa's luck was about to turn for the worse. While Detective Santoro no longer believed DeRosa was involved in Carmine Gargano's disappearance, he focused his investigation on DeRosa's crew. I focused on an individual by the name of Bobby Riggs. His real name was Robert Goglion. Uh, at the time, I was working in an undercover capacity, and I had arranged to meet with Bobby Goglion so I could purchase some crack cocaine from him. Robert Rags Goglion was a drug dealer working for the Lucchese family. Very quickly, Detective Santoro and his undercover crew were purchasing drugs from him and nearly all of the Lucchese dealers working in Brooklyn. After being into the case for a couple of months, we probably had bought about 20 to 30 street-level dealers. Once we hit all the street-level dealers, we identified the middle management part of this crew, which was Mike DeRosa, a guy by the name of Jimbo Lewis, Ronald Moran, and we realized that they were all kicking up to Froggy Galleon. It was going to be way too difficult and way too dangerous to try to bite DeRosa and Galleon directly. Narcotics enforcement is extremely dangerous. You're dealing with liars, you're dealing with murderers, and you're dealing with people that have guns as part of the trade. Midway into the case, we had enough probable cause to go up on a couple of phones, one of them being Ronald Moran's. So once we went up on Ronald Moran's phone, it was like opening up Pandora's box. Listen, you gotta drop off something to the other guy. You know what to do? You beep Jimmy. Beep him and tell him you'll meet with him. Because I ain't got nothing here to give him. Beep him and tell him you can meet him. Ronald Moran basically would have unguarded conversations about narcotics trafficking, and he would talk freely to Mike DeRosa back and forth every day of the week. And through Ronald Moran's phone, we were able to go up the ladder and get up onto Jimmy Galeon's phone and other phones within the organization. I've just been subjected to a mobile interrogation. You believe this? F what is that? Homicide was questioned for me about half an hour. Serious? Where? Right in the neighborhood? They want to take me to. The I said, pull over and tell me what you gotta tell me. Oh, I'm over here by the handcuff place. Come by. Nah, 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 nah. I'm afraid I may have locked up. You know, detectives only work from 8 in the morning to 4 at night. So I gotta be under investigation for them to pull me over at 7 o'clock. I'll make that kid drop me over there. All right, get somebody to drive you over here. Try to drop you off or something. In a short time, we realized that DeRosa was, was Galeon's guy, that he was one of the main managers out on the street. It became apparent to all of us involved in the investigation that DeRosa was so implicated and buried over the Galeon phone that he was going to be the guy we really focused on. I mean, in any investigation, you try to identify a guy that you have behind the eight ball the most, and DeRosa was our guy. Well, now we got DeRosa for conspiracy to distribute narcotics. We also got him uh, on RICO charges for being a manager of a criminal enterprise. In 1970, a law was passed known as RICO, the Racketeer Influence Corrupt Organizations Act. That really enabled the government to investigate and prosecute organizations rather than individuals for isolated crimes. That was a watershed moment and tackling all kinds of organized crime. Rudy Giuliani used that RICO law like a conductor at a symphony. He basically convicted guys just for being made members of an organized crime family. What it uh, gave the government authority to do was that if you were in any way implicated in what was called an ongoing criminal enterprise, any implication if you overheard an attack, somehow or other got money, you might face 20 years to life in prison. So for the first time, they had a tool to work up the line. So he's basically done. He's toast. Knowing this, I wanted to be the guy that executed his search warrant because I saw him as the weak link, and I wanted to get the first crack at this kid and see if maybe there's an inkling that he was going to cooperate. So I go to the front door, and I hear, open the door, like screams. I was like, what the hell? So I turn around, and I go to run inside my house. They kick my door down. I mean, within two minutes, they had the rosary in cuffs. They threw him out on his front lawn. They were inside the house, searching the house. Now I woke up to Mike DeRosa. I introduced myself to him, and I basically tell him that he's screwed. And just by the look in his eyes, I, I knew that I could see that the fear of God came over him. So they helped me in the house for a while. 
the next minute, I hear guys screaming over the radio, Freddie, you better get out of here. You got to come see this. At that time, I had 140000 in a satchel, and I had it upstairs, and my mother was nervous, not knowing what's going on. She took my money and flung it out the window. Landed in the cop's hands. Mother panicked, and she thought if she got rid of the money, we wouldn't find it, but she didn't look out on the street and see all the cops that were, that were downstairs. Mikey, I could see, was really nervous. I sat him down, I said, look, Mike, Obviously, you know, I know everything about you. We've been listening to your phone. And I proceeded to tell him, you know, things that only a guy that was listening to his phone would know. And he just looked up at me, and, and he sort of nodded, and he knew. It's decision time for Mikey Flattop DeRosa. Cooperate or spend the rest of his life in prison. Everything that I thought that that life was about growing up, really, like, there's nobody there for you once you go away. Mike DeRosa was arrested on drug and RICO charges and was taken to the Metropolitan Correctional Center, where he was held for several months. He was one of 38 members of organized crime arrested that day. Like I said, I was locked up, and I saw the time I was facing. I saw that when I was in, people started turning on me and telling, saying that I was cooperating when I wasn't, so I already got that rap. People stopped paying me my big money that they owed me on the street. And, you know, because when my friends were in jail, I was looking out for them. I made sure when Marvin was locked up, I made sure he had his money from his businesses. I went out, we hurt people for him and his workers. Nobody's looking out for my family or anything like they're supposed to. I was like, what am I doing? I'm facing 30 years on one charge. I'm going to get reindicted on other charges. I'm going to wind up getting 50, 60 years for what? And nobody's... Nobody's keeping up to what they got to keep up to, but I'm going to sit here and do all this time, and what am I going to come out to? The Rosa cooperated because he was looking at some serious jail time. Everything that I thought that that life was about growing up, really, like, there's nobody there for you once you go away. You could forget all that. And I decided, to... I'm done. DeRosa realized his family would not be taken care of by his criminal cohorts while he was in prison, so he decided to turn state's evidence. He flipped. Mike DeRosa flipped because he was facing a lot of time. The members of the mafia that became witnesses for the government didn't turn into informants overnight. In most cases, witnesses that we were able to draw from organized crime ranks came under enormous pressure because they were facing life sentences and murder cases. The other example of that would be a little bit different than that would be if there was some kind of a internal dissension in a crime family where a contract might be put on one of their own. They were going to put a contract out on my brother. And the target might learn about it, and he'd have nowhere to run but into the arms of the government. If God forbid anything happened to him. So he'll say he did it for his honor, he did it because this one was going to kill him, this one. No, he did it because he's a selfish criminal, and that's what selfish criminals do. They watch out for themselves. I don't think turning on your family means a thing. Who are you turning on? Insane, horrible, criminal murderers? that you made a pledge not to turn on them? The whole pledge was insane. I was like, what am I doing? Nobody's helping out. Nobody's doing nothing for me. I'm sitting here. The feds are in one ear trying to get me to flip. They're trying to confiscate everything from my family that is theirs. You know, my parents worked hard for everything they had. Then it comes to the deal with the prosecutor. I got to sit there, and we had a meeting. A proffer meeting is when the defendant wants to come in and tell you what he knows or what she knows in lieu of getting a deal, basically, the cuts on, uh, the, of the jail time down. Giving a break to a, a murderer is a tough call, and it only makes sense if the overall enterprise of the government to help eliminate organized crime is going to be moved forward substantially. And so you listen along with the prosecutor on what this person knows, and you weigh how valuable that information is to help you launch another case. You can identify and investigate other members of a criminal organization. Because after all, uh, you're, what you're dealing with are sociopaths who dedicated their lives to murdering, stealing, so uh, it's a difficult choice. It's a grave ethical question what you do with informants. Sometimes their crimes are almost as severe as the people they're testifying against. So they knew what was going on, and they knew if I was lying or not, and they told me, they said, you lie, you're going to do 30 years. 
So it's on you. We know a lot of what's going on already. So we will know if you're holding back or not. Then they said, if everything is on the up and up, we will write a 5K1 letter for you. The agreement's pretty simple. What the defendant gets in return for his cooperation is the promise of the government to make a motion to the court under Rule 5K1.1 of the sentencing guidelines to sentence this defendant below the guidelines. And that means anywhere from zero to life. The only one that can give the informant a break is the judge. It's ultimately up to the judge as to what he wants to do with it. If he doesn't want to do anything with it, he doesn't have to. So the only thing you can tell this guy is that I will let the judge know through the prosecutor the extent of your cooperation. Like everybody else, I was stressed out up until the day I got sentenced because you never know. You know, you remember, you get from zero years to 30 years. So even though with your cooperation, if the judge, because it's all onto the judge now, if the judge feels that you should get 30 years, you're going to get 30 years. So the judges are acutely aware of the strategies that the government has used very successfully in tackling and organized crime. Accordingly, sentences far below the life maximum in cases where a defendant lived up to his responsibilities have been imposed. So I was in for five years, close to five years. I was testifying on cases while I was locked up. Once DeRosa decided to flip, it was like a house of cards. I mean, he gave up so many people, and in turn, those people flipped. And this case was like round zero to a bunch of other cases. Mike DeRosa's life as a gangster was over. He turned on the only friends and family he had ever known. We took out the core of the Lucchese, Bonanno, Colombo, and Gambino family. Well, it's in my opinion that Mike, Mike DeRosa should be afraid for his life right now. After his arrest and his decision to flip, DeRosa was forced to testify against his friends, fellow Lucchese family members, and high-ranking members of New York's other five families. I was at the trial, and I was a little nervous. My first trial, after I do this, it's going to be out there. Everybody's going to know that I'm a witness. I was nervous. I mean, I couldn't sleep. Nothing. They had everybody I knew in the courtroom, and it was just, ugh. Got me right in the gut. I testified against Anthony Spiro from a concierge of the Bonanno family for having ordered the hit on a Paulie Galino. It led to the arrest of the concierge of the Bonanno crime family, who was Anthony Spiro at the time, and Spiro's doing life in jail because of it. I'm actually glad that I did it against Spiro because he was just no good. Also on trial during that time were John Matera and Anthony Ferrara. Unlike Spiro, these two former members of organized crime were Mike DeRosa's close friends. I actually cried. I didn't want to go up against John. I genuinely liked John. It hurt because I knew his wife, his kids, his mother, everyone. He pled guilty to uh, 20 years, but he had already did eight years prior on my case. All the other cases that I brought in, people pled guilty, so they didn't go to trial. So it worked, and that's what they did. They started small with the small fry guys, and they and they worked their way up. And people don't realize that the backbone of this case was really the $20 bag of crack, which is a pretty amazing thing, because out of that $20 bag of crack, these guys were making approximately $25 million a year, and it was going straight up to the Lucchese crime family upper echelon, and we proved that. We took out the core and the bud of the Lucchese, Bonanno, Colombo, and Gambino family. And the case was really one of the most successful cases that I have ever worked on in my entire career. It had broken the barrier and the rule of Omerta. Omerta, the code of silence. Every member of the Mafia takes an oath to maintain his family's secrets. They had exposed all of their higher-ups and everyone below them to prosecution, and they pretty much shattered the myth of loyalty in the ranks of organized crime. It's like amazing. If Omerta, forget about it. Everybody turns on each other because they want a lighter jail sentence. The government saw that I was holding up my end of the bargain, so then they held up theirs. They had finally given me bail after five years, then I went back for sentencing two years after that. I wind up getting time served, so the time served was four years and eight months, I believe I was in. 
and then I was released, and now I'm living my life the way I'm living it. They have all sorts of options, and I think the government can set them up and then leave them alone. I think that's the, the deal that Mikey DeRosa opted for. And in, in his case, again, I mean, who wants to live under those sort of strict guidelines? When I first got out, I walked away with nothing. The government, I had nothing. I was working for $8 an hour. Also, I didn't want to be a parasite on the government. I just felt like, you know what? I did what I did. I'm not looking for a handout from anybody. I hustled illegally. I could hustle legitimately. I could make it on my own without the help of anybody. And that's what I chose. Are there parasites that are witnesses now? Yes, there are. There's lazy bastards that need to live off the government and try to get whatever they can from it. I'm just not that guy. Never was, never will be. After being released from prison, DeRosa was relocated by the government and began working in the real estate business. I got involved in deals that I made, and I did very well with them. And at some points in my legitimate life, what I made in a month, I made more than when I was doing illegal stuff. It's if you're meant to have it, you're going to have it. And if you're not, you're not. You know, he's living the life of Riley. And, and that's what cracks me up about these guys. There is a sense, I think, that if you have enough information, if you're armed with information about some of your criminal compatriots, you can essentially get away with everything and start a brand new life. You know, I made several hundreds of thousands in, within a year span. And um, I still have other things going on that I make money with. And that's who I am. I'm a hustler, and I'll always earn. DeRosa has made a new life for himself, but it comes at a very steep price. After the informants take the deal, testify in court, it's known that they're informants, it's not an easy road because you cannot go back to the neighborhood. You have to cut all ties with the previous friends and associates, so it's not an easy existence. Well, it's in my opinion that Mike, Mike DeRosa should be afraid for his life right now. There was a lot of these bad guys that he put away they're getting close to coming out right now, and, uh, you know, he has to be careful. Is it dangerous? Yes. But you know what? The same way I lived on the streets that I never knew what tomorrow was going to bring is what I'm doing now. These are some bad guys that they're not shy and they're not afraid to murder. They've done it before. What's going to preclude them from doing it again? I have nightmares till today. I wake up like with pains in like my chest and everything else. It's just something that I have to live with. I don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring, but I'm not gonna hide from nobody. I'm not gonna live in fear, and I'm just gonna do my thing. I got my legitimate businesses. I don't bother nobody for anything, and that's just what it is. Regret? I can't say that I regret a lot. Um, I had a good life in that life. I've lived a life to where CEOs of companies live when they're 65 years old. I lived it when I was in my teens and my early 20s. Did I pay for it? Yes. Was it worth it? Yes.